Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum on Highland Avenue in the heart of Hollywood, and we're in the historic Max Factor building. Our guests today are choreographer Christopher Bordenave and artist Casper Brindle. Choreographer Christopher Bordenave was born and raised in Los Angeles. He studied at the Alvin Ailey School, the Lines Ballet School, and he has a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Dance from Dominican University. He's performed the works of Nacho Duado, Alonzo King, and Eden Shirabi. But he's also danced with companies in the U.S. and abroad. He's the co-founder of this No One Art House. I don't know what that is. And he's working on developing a cross-genre uh, play right now called Strings Attached. So you're working with director Madeline um, Levitt. Levitt, right? And you've worked in theater before, I presume. Or is this a first-time theater uh, experience? Um, I predominantly worked in dance. Um, so this show is, yeah, kind of a cross collaboration between contemporary dance, puppetry, and a little bit of theater, yes. So it's a real mix. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is you're the choreographer, but there's also a puppet choreographer. Right. And there's like, what does that mean? Well, the puppet choreographer, Lisa, kind of, uh, they, her and Madeline went to New York and they learned the technique of the puppets from a woman there uh, who had been working with puppets for 40 years and they came oh. back here. They only went there for two days and then they came back here and had been developing this language for the puppets for about three years. And so once they kind of showed me what the moves, I mean, what the puppets can do, then I incorporated them with dance. But you had people on stage that you were choreographing, right? Right. So what, what, what kind of dance was that or what kind of movement? Uh, it's contemporary dance. So it was just, you know, trying to see what um, could work with the puppets because they're a bit fragile. So we didn't want to make the movement too physical so that, you know, they would rip the puppets apart. But they're apart. not puppets on strings, are they? No, they are. Oh, some of them are on strings. Some of them are handheld, too, I think. She showed me that they're made from socks and yeah, stri th balls of string <laughs> and yarn. They're fantastic. Yeah, there's a dog that's involved that can be detached from the strings, but uh, he's mainly on strings. Oh, yes. uh, mm -hmm. I see. So when you went to high school, did you know that you were going to be a dancer? Yeah, I went to Alexander Hamilton High School um, in Culver City here, and we had a dance department. Uh, ah, so yeah. that was your path. Yeah, I've been dancing from a very young age here in L.A., and um, it's always been a dream to join a company and dance and eventually choreograph, and I'm doing that. You're doing that. When you left Hamilton, did you go right to college? I did. To, to Where is that school? I went to um, a school called SUNY Purchase in upstate oh, New York. Oh, yeah, SUNY Purchase, did you? I did, for only a semester, though. It uh -huh. was a little too rural for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like in the sticks, really, isn't it? Yeah, and then I went to the Alvin Ailey School, which was right in Manhattan, which oh, was amazing. That's where you, right from high school. Or, uh, or did you go to, where was Dominican? I moved around a lot. So I went to Purchase first, I left, I went to Ailey, and uh, New York was I a little see. bit too much for me. And then I moved to San Francisco <laughs> where Lyons and Dominican was. Oh, oh, is it up north? Yeah. In San Francisco? I forgot. Dominican, of yeah. course. Mm -hmm. It was a joint program between Dominican U University, which is in San Rafael, and right. Lyons Ballet, which is right in the middle of San Francisco. Oh, so San, San Rafael, I remember, mm -hmm. is where... Dominican is yeah. because my kids went to camp there. Now I remember oh, they, wow. when they were in like high school too. So when Lines was a company that was in San Francisco, because I don't know about that. Yes, they're a very established uh, contemporary ballet company in San Francisco. They've been around for like 30, 40 years. Classical or more contemporary? It's contemporary ballet, yeah. 
And then you dance with a variety of companies. Did you get go to these companies after Lines or after Ailey, or when did those happen? Yeah, while I was at Ailey, um, I was apprenticing with Complexions Contemporary Ballet, mm -hmm. and then after I graduated from the Lions School, Alonzo asked me to join the company. And then from there, I worked with a company in New York called Morphosis, and after that, oh, I danced Morphesis, in Chicago. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you went to Chicago, too? Chicago with a company called Luna Negra Dance Theater, and then I moved back to Los Angeles and have just been doing my own work. So did you audition for all these different companies? Is that what happens? Yes, you have to do an audition with a bunch of people, and then they make a number of cuts, and then you find out if you get it or not. But they're, are they small or large companies? Um, in the contemporary dance world, they're pretty big companies. Oh, they are? From what number to what number? Oh, you company? mean in size of the yeah, company? Yeah, company. No, the number of people in the company. It's, I've only danced in about like a 10-member company. Yeah, they're yeah. usually pretty small, mm -hmm. aren't they? And you all depend on each other? How do, Very how much. do you get along? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, when you're with a big ballet company, you right. know, you have the chorus and, and the principals right. and all the choreographers and music mm -hmm. and all that that you are with you all the time right yeah it's a very intimate um, exchange <laughs> in smaller contemporary companies yeah it won't work unless the people get along because you're with each other all day you're developing new work um, yeah so it's just really integral that all of the energy is cohesive and so tell me what that dance range is is it um, a dance range that you have or that you have to get together for your choreography, or what? How does it work, really? Um, is it all from you, or is it from what you've learned from other people? Or it's it's everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, growing up here, all of my teachers really encouraged us to learn as many styles as I could. So uh, you know, I did ballet and modern and jazz and African and hip hop. So, so you took classes in all these. Yeah, and then once I started auditioning to be a professional, um, all of those things helped me because all of the choreographers that I've worked with um, are all very different in their styles. So just having all of that to call upon has really helped me. And do you, do you work out? Do you go to class every day? Or do you um, give a class? What do you do? How do I you do both. Um, I've been substituting a lot at CalArts, so I teach there a oh, lot. Oh, you do. Um, and they, I try and take class. Do they have a big dance department yes, at CalArts? Yes, the program at CalArts is incredible. Um, I love all the students. I love the vibe that they have there. They really um, push individuality for their students. Yeah. And do you take class? Can you take class there? Yeah, I, <laughs> I haven't just because I've been working on Strings Attached, but um, yeah, when this is over, I'll probably get back into it. Well, tell us where Strings Attached is. It's at the L.A. Shakespeare Center um, in downtown on First Street. And, yeah. and what does it include? Because we talked about it crossing genres and we mm. talked about puppets. What else is in it? Um, there's a very talented, uh, I don't want to marginalize her because she does many things, but she's acting and puppeteering in the show, and she's trained in Commedia dell'arte. Oh. So there's a portion of the show with her where she's kind of interacting with the dog, and so you get a little bit of acting in there, too. And what's the story? Is there a story? No, it's a pretty abstract um, idea. All of the puppets are designed to evoke a different emotion, so we kind of just ride on this journey of seeing the dancers and the puppets interact, and you can kind of just take from it what you will. But it's mainly about just human connection and how mm. we relate to each other and yeah. You you talked to, in your bio, you say you're the repetiteur. Yes. What is that? <laughs> of of Gustavo Sansano. Yes, um Gustavo Ramirez Sansano was the director of Luna Negra Dance Theater, which was the company in Chicago. Oh. And he's a very famous um choreographer that does work all over the world. Um so I'm authorized to set his work. So if he, what does that mean? So tell us what that means. So if he choreographed a piece on one company and another company says, oh, I want to have that piece in my company, I can be the one to go and set that work on oh, a new company. You actually go and do it. Right. I mean, do the choreography. I see. Reset the choreography. Or re mm -hmm. Reset it. Mm -hmm. So they already know it, right? Well, it's already existing, so I just kind of take it there and put it on this new company. And what is so special about Gustavo's work? Um, there are a lot of things. He's a very musical person. He's also a very um, cerebral and creative person. So we just really got along, and I really found a connection with his work in my body. Um, 
Yeah, so I just really love seeing the way that he works, and I love being able to share that with other people. What kind of movements are they? Uh, they're contemporary movements. Um, there's some influence from ballet. He was also um, a classically trained Spanish dancer. That's what I wanted. So wondered. he did flamenco. Yeah. Um, so that there's an influence in there as well. And did you take flamenco classes? I didn't. <laughs> no, but, but that's where you learn from the choreographer, I guess, right? Exactly, He shows yeah. you the moves. Right. When he does things, you know, I just really try and listen and watch and implement it in my body. So what do you suggest for young dancers what what should they look for I say that young dancers should try and expose themselves to as many different styles and forms of art as possible um, my mother always took me to a lot of shows aside from dance oh, to see yeah theater uh, visual art musical art and it just really <laughs> inspired me to you know cross genre like we're doing in this show um, yeah so I would just really recommend that young people just approach art uh, from all sides, not just one. Before we leave, I know this is probably what you teach at the No One Art House because yes. you're a co-founder of that. Tell us what that means. Um, no One Art House is an interdisciplinary uh, collective that exists here in Los Angeles and we offer workshops and performances all throughout LA. How did they get to you? Well, me and three friends uh, co-founded it because we all left LA and then we all came back and we're like, you know, LA really needs this because we don't see um, the type of work that we would experience in other places here in L.A. But is, are there that many venues? I mean, is there that much room for that? There is. We try and do work in unconventional spaces, like in art galleries. Oh. So, um, yeah, so we can bring it a little bit closer to people so it's not so detached on a stage. You know, it, when people have it closer to them, I think they connect with it more. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then what kind of music? All kinds. All kinds? Yeah, do you play kinds. an instrument? <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> Well, we're going to leave you with that wish, okay. and we hope that you learn something. <laughs> your body is your instrument, right? Exactly. So thank you so much, Christopher. Yeah. We were so happy to have you today. I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here in the historic Max Factor building, which Donnell Dadigan has made into the Hollywood Museum. It's on Highland Avenue in the heart of Hollywood. And our guest is artist Casper Brindle, who was born in Toronto, Canada, and raised in Los Angeles when his British-born parents decided to move here. He graduated from University High, and has had art shows and exhibitions throughout the United States. So what was your first influence, Casper? Were you thinking of an art career? Uh, first influence, I would say, I don't, I don't remember if it was a first influence. I'll, I, I, I do remember um, in high school, um, I always painted as kind of an outlet and... Um, and uh, did that, but it was uh, my father who took me to an exhibit uh, at, at that time, the Temporary Contemporary. Right, uh, downtown, downtown right. in that old warehouse. Right, <laughs> and it was a light and space show. Oh, right. I, I forget think, what it was, but Frank Gehry had designed the space, right? I, I believe so. Yes, and then they had this light and space show in it. Right, and um, I'm going to say it was late 80s, I think. And Dan Flavin, uh, oh. I, I don't remember everybody that was in it, but um, it had a, a really big impact on me. But your father was an architect, right? Yes. And and was that an influence? Did he take you to art events? Did did the architecture kind of um, make you think about art? I was definitely exposed to those types of things. Uh, my mother also being a dress designer. Oh, right. So I would... Um, Always, I mean, there was always a drafting table. Back then, they used drafting tables, not computers. <laughs> Don't they use it anymore? Yeah, yeah. No more? So I would sit there for hours on end just doodling and, and keeping myself busy, uh, as Did, well as listening to, like, Pink Floyd, The Dark Side um, of the Moon. At, so you, you, know, you, had, like, you had, like, this real pop, yeah. real pop influence. And then, right. But um, did he do art projects, or did he work on commercial Buildings? Um, yeah, he did. He did, My father specialized in high rises, oh, right. laboratories, um, 
and uh, yeah, high rises, laboratories, big, high, you know, big buildings. Those don't to me seem very creative. High rises. That's a terrible thing to say, but boom, you know. And uh, and those mid century houses that were really predominant. They were all around Uni High, weren't they? Um, yeah, I you know I, I I'd have to disagree. I mean, I think I think art. You can do whatever you want to do. Uh -huh. There's n really no boundaries. It's open. But uh, I, I couldn't be an architect. There's too many. I mean, it, ha it has to be functional. Right. That's and, what I mean. Yeah, so yeah. to me, it's like, boom, it's functional. Yeah. I but guess, it doesn't have to look pretty when it's functional, right? Well, <laughs> it, it, you know, I think a lot of that comes to the underbelly of architecture, which is the money. If you have the money and you want to build a beautiful building, you can do it. But... As far as business goes, I don't think people put the money into the buildings as right. they so should just, or would or, right. or are willing to. Give me four walls, right? And fill right. up my space. Exactly. I want at least as quickly as possible. And move okay. Them out. Well, I'm, I'm looking at this because I know architecture is a real form of art in my mind and dress designing as well. Mm -hmm. and, and you were at Uni High. Did you go to art school? Um, I did not. I was... Uh, uh, high school for me um, was uh, a little. I was I was surfing more than I was. I was just going to say you were the surfer. I yeah, know that. Yeah. And um, I think I just didn't uh, put all my energy into it. I was but putting it into other things. Do you think art school is necessary? <clears throat> no. And but tell me but why. I will, yeah, but I will say this. Uh, after high school, I did. I was going to go to San Francisco Art Institute uh -huh. and visited it, and and it was a wonderful school, uh, but it just never played out. Um, do you have to go to art school? Well, no. I think there's there's this is my ongoing debate in my head. <laughs> That's right? why I'm asking, right? So uh, in one, in I think that being surrounded by likewise people mm -hmm. and, and people who are in the arts and just super creative is very important. So that's um, not necessarily in an art school. That's, a ne that's more of a social situation or well, work situation. Yes, but I, I do think in school, whether it's you know, uh -huh. UCLA, where, whatever school, it doesn't have to be the arts, being surrounded by people your uh -huh. age that are all doing the same thing uh, it is supportive. Yeah, it um, makes a difference, yeah, right? Yeah, I think that part of it, um, I think I missed out on oh, I because see. of the support. I was kind of by myself doing my own thing. The other thing is that being in art school, I mean, all my friends went to art school, uh, is, you know, sometimes you have to forget what you learned so you can get your own identity. That's true. Uh, my my uh, trajectory, if you will, was... Uh, learn, fail, fail, learn, learn, fail, and keep going until you know the the, the path is. is but you just but you decided you were going to be an artist, and then you learn, fail, learn, failed, right? Well, yeah. So so when did that start? I know you worked for Eric Orr, who was do we call him Light and Space? Uh, yeah, or it's, space it's definitely t he's in that vein somewhere. Yeah. So was that one of your first forays into art? Yeah. Um, I yes, I started working for Eric uh, after high school. Oh, um, so it was like uh, influence. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was doing it. He was he was successful. Uh, he was nice. He was he was he was charismatic and nice. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things about him. If you know Eric and you know how he talks like this, right. you know. But you were you were in his studio every day. I mean, yeah. I knew him as an artist on the outside right. and he was a really great guy and we miss him a lot in the art world. Yeah, I mean, Eric, I think uh, he was is now is a little underrated as art. I mean, he was a big big person in that uh, era for sure yeah and um, when they had the Pacific Standard Time I think they only had one exhibit of his and I think it was in San Diego at oh. uh, the museum but he was overlooked because he left us too soon I think maybe he hadn't could, reached his thing could be part of it yeah um, yeah he was he was always kind to me and uh, and I was you know as as being a young kid at that time, and how I how I left, 
or got fired actually, oh, really? which is a great story. Okay. Um, we were installing one of his sculptures, and uh, I needed to get a couple friends to help me because, if you know, these sculptures are pretty big. And we uh, went to install it, and my friend <laughs> picked it up wrong, and they were they were both in UCLA just trying to earn extra money, and it broke. And there, you know, I had a couple days. That's the nightmare. That's the That's nightmare. That's the nightmare of installations. I think anything, even if it's a painting on the wall, yeah. you have to be so careful. But he sent me away with a ball of Jack Daniels and said, When Sorry. he left, when, he, when <laughs> yeah. you left, okay. So here you are, the surfer. You're uh -huh. working for a light and space guy. Mm -hmm. um, I think, to me, your work is influenced by surfboards. Now, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Um, it definitely is. I mean, the work uh, originated uh, with uh, the older generation, with the you know the, the hot rod culture, mm -hmm. surfboard culture, fetish finish, finish fetish, fetish uh, finish. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, light and space. Right. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'm the next generation of uh, those people doing it. Um, and I've forgotten the question. Where were we? No, we, we wanted to know how much surfboards, uh, the actual surface yeah. of the surfboards. Right. Because when I look at your work, it looks like the horizon. I'm going to just show something right here um, so you can talk about it. But it, it could look like a surfboard. Yeah, I mean, the aesthetic, definitely. Uh, you have the resin, uh, which gives you that super finish on it. Um, the horizons, uh, you know, I've spent numerous days in the ocean looking at the horizon. Um, the aesthetic of it all is, you know, again, car culture too. High right. gloss with, the, you know, a hot rod paint. I mean, it all stems from somewhere. So how does it, how does it actually come about? How do these colors come to your, to, into your palette. Well, to be honest, I just uh, I just go at it, and uh, so the, paintings, the color. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I picked the pal You know, luckily I've always been good with color, um, but uh, the paintings start, um, and then they kind of lead me to where they're gonna go. It's very interesting because it's toxic. The work that the the work that you're doing, it's, and you, it's like being like. What painting an automobile in a booth? Yeah, in a so, booth. So right. I have a mask on the whole time, and and I'm and I'm painting. Um, and where does the color come from? So the the actual color. Um, I used to use automotive paints. Oh. Um, I don't anymore because of the toxicity. Uh -huh. um, so I've moved on to acrylics mostly, unless I'm looking for something. And you still spray them? Still spraying, um, unless I'm looking for something particular that I can't get with an acrylic. And uh, what, what do you call this work? I'm going to show another uh, that's, piece. That, um, this series is my uh, Stratum series. Um, stratum is Horizon. But do we call it uh, a mixed media abstraction, or do we call it a I, I call finish it, fetish? I, I, I don't it, know. I would call it... Uh, a mix of color field, light and space, oh. and finish fetish painting. Color field too, right? Yeah, I mean the colors are uh, obviously a huge part of the work. Um, so do you start, how do you start? Do you draw? Um, no, so what I was saying with this series, um, it's really just about um, starting with a color and, and letting the painting take me where it's going to take me and making decisions along the way. And do you start with a certain size? Yeah, well, usually... Always the same size? No. Oh. Uh, my favorite size um, for that work is uh, probably 48 by 96. So they're long, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, because, I mean, they're horizon, so you want right. them to, right. you know, you want right. them to have some breadth in right. there. So, um, but then, uh, yeah, the... You know, so the, you start with a long piece of wood, actually. Well, it's actually um, a frame... Uh, and then uh, dye bond, which is uh, acrylic sandwich between two pieces of aluminum. Oh, oh, so there's aluminum to it, too. Yeah. Oh, I but see. But you don't see any of it, but what that does is it, it gives it a, a super flat finish that I can paint on. Do you, do you sand it? Uh, sometimes. It depends. Uh, usually uh, dye bond. Yeah, you know it's, need. yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty smooth. And then how many layers do you spray on there? 
Uh, I could be spraying for days and days and days. I mean, is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, some of these paintings have uh, gallons and gallons of paint on them. And as I say, the paintings take me where they're going to take me. So until this is a different. Usually they're horizontal. Right. This is vertical. You're starting a different look. Yeah. So that's a new body of work that I'm doing uh, right now at my sh uh, my current exhibition. Um, these are uh, not not the horizon paintings. Uh, they're vo yeah. What are I tell me? What yeah, they are? Yeah. So they're um, you know they're voids. They're they're definitely in the light and space uh, uh, ballpark again. Um, Rather than explain my work, I like people to come up with their own explanations uh, well, of it. I, 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 will, I will touch on it. <laughs> but that being said, I mean, uh, I've had people say that they're voids, that they're kind of these symbols of uh, these kind of godly things but aren't religious, but they have some kind of spirituality oh, to I, them. I can see all of those yeah, things yeah, yeah. that you're talking about. And the one thing I just saw the uh, exhibit at the William Turner Gallery in Bergamot Station, and this is, uh, is this the installation yeah, shot? that's one of the is this right? Yeah. So this is the installation shot, and as you can see, most of them are horizontal, right? Right, so I have, uh, in this exhibition, I have the stratums in the uh, big room, and then I have the aura paintings in the back. In the back. Right. And the thing that I loved about this installation was the floors are black. Yeah, it's a nice, nice. And thing. the pieces look like they're floating. Yeah, I'm They're water. reflecting on right. the bottom, and yet they look like they're floating. Right. And so many of them look like, horizons at different times of the sunset. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, th that is an extra uh, gift, as you will. I mean, the, the way that they look, it looks like these just color fields just floating on the floor. So obviously you painted the floor. Black. Well, the, the, yeah. <laughs> And then... Um, because of the feeling of the installation. Right. And then in the back room, that's the new work um, with um, the auras. And if you look at the work... Um, the, the the backs of the frames are painted in neon, so the actual painting moves onto the wall. So this is more paint than spray. Well, that those those are still sprayed, but they're they're definitely um, there's not the uh, resin finish on them. Oh, so that makes a difference. So they're not real yeah. shiny, shiny. Right, right, right. But they're used. They still have pearlescent paint and the flakes and from the car uh, world, and then the backs are painted in a. Uh, uh, fluorescent color, so the painting splashes onto the wall. Oh, so you have this double reflection. Right. So I'm getting in the front room. I'm getting the reflection in the black floor, and then in the other room, I'm getting it from the wall. Right. Oh, that's yeah, fantastic. The, the painting continues onto the and wall. Are they heavy? Uh, I guess that's subjective. Uh, <laughs> they're, you know. Can uh, you just hang 50, them on the wall? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm so glad you came and. Gave us the insight because um, you look at those pieces and they're really beautiful. Thank so you. thank you, Casper. Thank you. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. We'll see you next time. But keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com.